The views and opinions expressed in the following podcast do not necessarily reflect those of the producers, the affiliates, or digital platforms hosting this podcast. All content is for the purposes of education, conjecture, and at times entertainment. We promote inclusiveness and diversity. Enjoy the show. Welcome to Into the Deep with Jay Casta. Welcome to Into the Deep. I'm Jay Costa. I am honored to host today's guest. She's not only a well-respected clairvoyant empath, visionary, popular lecturer, but she's one of the first early pioneers in the intuition development movement, specializing in expanded perception and inner energy dynamics. She's the best-selling author of Frequency, The Power of Personal Vibration. I'm talking about Penny Pierce. Penny's work needs no introduction. She's the author of 10 books with a forthcoming 11th, including, but not limited to, Transparency, Leap of Perception, The Intuitive Way, and Frequency, The Power of Personal Vibration, the seminal book on living in an energy-based reality, which provides a reassuring step-by-step roadmap into a positive state of awareness. A book that made its way onto my desk over a decade ago. Penny's work is open-minded, practical, and sophisticated all at the same time. She synthesizes diverse cultural and spiritual worldviews with her many years of experience in business as a corporate art director. Her longtime focus on the dynamics of consciousness and energy gives Penny a deep psychological understanding and the expertise with natural laws as well as a designer's skill in bringing higher thought into form. We talk about all kinds of things, from her path from design and her time with CalArts to even designing an elevator, which was a pretty interesting story. When we talk frequency and vibration, we talk consciousness, we also get into multi-dimensions. I absolutely adored my conversation with Penny, and I just want to get right to it. So without further ado, join me as we seek light and journey into the deep with Penny Pierce. Enjoy. If you could share for our our listeners and our viewers who you are and and what it is you do. Ah, that's that's a long (laughs) description. (laughs) Uh, Like I was just saying, I, um, I started off Uh, not really knowing that I had any abilities. And I just started studying uh, design, basically. And then that evolved. And I went through a lot of changes. I moved around the country a lot. And then um, I found a program out in California at CalArts, which was an experimental program at Disney's school there. And um, it was called social design. And we did things like redesign the elevator so people would talk to each other inside or redesign the doctor-patient relationship and things that really worked on that intuition muscle and abstract thinking and pattern recognition and things like that, which I think was very helpful because how else would you learn to be a a professional intuitive (laughs) later in life? Fair enough. Yeah. So so that, but then that morphed because I moved up to Northern California right at the beginning of all kinds of the spiritual movements and everything was happening and, um, and started taking clairvoyance classes. So then that I found out I was good at it and had all these kind of visionary dreams that I didn't even know were that. And so it's just been a process of unfolding and unfolding and unfolding and unfolding, and then learning more and integrating it into the soup, you know? So Uh, At this point, I pretty much, I like to do things that like a personal level, me and nothing, just creativity, (laughs) Mm -hmm. right? Me and one other person, me and small groups of people and me and large groups of people and, or, you know, me and nature, you know, just different focal lengths, I guess, you know, so I really love writing. So um, I'm working on my 11th book right now. And um and uh, and I love talk to, uh, counseling, you know. So I just really try to 
what, you know, like change the proportions of what I do among those different things, you know, and I love graphics and photography and, and, you know, so both sides of the brain. Mm -hmm. Oh gosh. I love that. Yeah. And once COVID's calmed down, I can start traveling again, which I really like. (laughs) Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. (laughs) (laughs) Do you find it uh, that you're able to just, I mean, gosh, you're like a Renaissance woman. You're just taking all of these different, you know, uh, I guess using all of your senses really, and Mm -hmm. just putting it into Mm -hmm. everything you do. Do you feel like it's an extension of just what your spirit is just collecting this data and just, I don't know, bringing it to people. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Well, I feel like it's probably like all of us are, you know, that we are extremely multidimensional, multifaceted creatures Mm -hmm. And especially if you are clearing yourself and you start having more memory of past lives and other things you've done or places you've been or, and, and I think I must've chosen this kind of life where I traveled every two years growing up and all kinds of different environments. And then after I left home, all kinds of different environments and different kinds of people. And so that I became more well-rounded, you know, and, um, and there's so much more to add into the soup, <laughs> you know. Uh, so I think you can't give up your curiosity and uh, love of surprise as you get older. You know, you have to keep that; otherwise, you just kind of calcify. You know, and I don't ever want to be like that. Um, but I do think that um, you know we're not just drawing from our own past or our parents or our lineages, which is part of it, but also from our past lives and also from everybody's past lives, you know, and it's all there in this big pool of knowledge that when you need something, I always call it like a pantry, you know, you take your ingredients off the shelf to make your cookies and then you put them back again, you know, and, uh, but it's all there for you, you know, use it and then put it away again. You don't have to try to memorize and hold it all consciously to yourself. You know, things come at the right moment. So I figured that's uh, that's kind of the way I think about identity. Mm. You know, there's no fixed identity, but I think there are predilections maybe that we have as certain kinds of souls that, um, you know, just come through. <laughs> mm. Yeah. You know? I feel the same way too, because there are times where, you know, certain points in my life where something may have not even been an interest or on my radar. And then all of a sudden it just somehow works its way into my life and I'm fascinated by it. Yes. 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 Um, I like those surprises, you know, that, um, and then suddenly it just feels, aha, I know why it's happening, you know, (laughs) 100%. One hundred percent. Yeah, and then it because like then it integrates. Like I ended up going to Japan early in my career. Um, like every year, it it I went once to work with the Center for Applied Intuition that I was working with, and then every year I got invited back, and for like twenty something years, and that was like. I mean, you couldn't take a training or seminar that would shift your consciousness around and balance you out from the East to the West and back and forth uh, like that. That was a very powerful. Hmm. Um, yeah. And it was a surprising, I would never have thought of it that I would be going there. That was not on my radar, but you know, powerful. Absolutely. I, I can align. Uh, I I've had the opportunity to go to Japan three times now with uh, mm-hmm. with my musical band and we toured mm. over there and it was just life-changing. So I can totally understand that. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's it's 180 degrees from the way we think. And, and yet it's like such an elegant and perfect way of thinking also Mm -hmm. that, you know, there's no right or wrong. It's just so interesting to flip your consciousness around like that. Absolutely. Yeah. And, And how have you felt like you've been able to take some of those experiences, right? Where maybe you've had your consciousness either shifted, flipped upside down, spun around and, you know, put that into your work. Um, 
Well, I think it's made me a lot less judgmental for one thing and, um, and patient in order to see through things and go into things and merge with them to feel them as myself. Does that make sense? You know, like um, feel a flower, I go in and merge with it. And then I know the world from that point of view. And then I find the self or that conscious universal stuff inside anything I do that with, you know, so it's almost like you just go into anything and find yourself there. And it's, it could be personal self or an impersonal self mm-hmm. or both at the same time or something. I don't know, but um, yeah. Um, I guess it's just, it's just a sense of, um, of understanding different ways of being and seeing how they fit together in, in a larger, you know, whole, you know, I don't know how to even talk about it, but yeah, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's just expanded my mind and, and, um, but also I think it reminded me of, um, a positive view on possibly negative past lives, like to go through it, but not get freaked out because some bad thing happened to me in in one of these countries, which I had memory of. And then I didn't go there and it turned and let go, Mm. you know? So some of it I think has been a healing of karma, if you will. Um, So a reframing. Mm. Love that. I love that. <laughs> and, and clearly putting you on this path of intuition, it seems. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, I didn't, I didn't really realize that that's what it was going to be about. Mm. Uh, but I think when you study design and, um, and art and writing and so forth, that, that it makes you very aware of, uh, principles of beauty principle universal principles things that have harmony naturally things that work mm-hmm. naturally and and things that don't work you know you you do a graphics and you know you need a certain balance of elements on a page and color and shape or texture and and uh, and ties things that tie together in ways um and that runs throughout everything that I think about. You know, I'm always looking for that, whether it's in my living room and hanging a new painting or something, or, you know, being out in the world with groups and finding the harmony in a group, things like that. I love that. It's that effect that it has on us. And yet sometimes we're not aware why it has such a profound effect on us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And sometimes the insights are so subtle that uh, you don't really notice them right away. Mm-hmm. You know, it yeah. Like if it is about harmony, it takes some repetition before you go. Oh, I see what I've been doing, what I've been showing myself. Mm. Uh, yeah, now I get it. You know, because <laughs> I had to. I had to make a choice that I have what I call my inner perceiver. You know, it's like that Holy Spirit function or the revealer function that that helps me notice what I notice. And then I made a decision to trust that part of myself. You could call it your inner teacher or whatever you like, but or the inner voice. But I try to notice what I notice throughout the day or if I go on a walk or on an errand and um, and then say, oh, why am I showing myself this? out of all the things I could have noticed. And then I dialogue with that part of myself and I get answers. I ask questions, I get answers. I write in my journal the same way. I ask myself that part of me, something like, what is prayer? You know, that I get it and I I answer it. And um, I guess that's partly my entertainment also, you know, (laughs) right? You know, uh, it's, it's interesting to see what will come when you don't really have a preconceived idea of it. I I went for a walk with my dog yesterday, I think it was, to this kind of 
park where a lot of families do stuff. They have a skate skating, you know, skateboard thing and a baseball diamond and all that. But I saw this group of four little kids running back in the far end of the thing. And then they came around and, and then I kind of intersected with them at a point and they were so excited. One of the little girls had on a lime green wig, a shiny lime green wig. Mm. They were about 10 maybe. And the little boy yelled out at me, he said, we're out looking for sketchy things. And I went, Oh, and we saw, uh, this kind of thing. And we think we heard a gun go off and there was a painting on the back of the outhouse over or the bathroom over there, you know, that was like this and this. And then they, they saw all these, and I said, sketchy things. I was like, I said, you guys should, you know, form a, a private detective agency. You'd be, we'd be great at that. You know, <laughs> it's like, I would never have seen that if I hadn't been walking my dog, you know, like, like it just was so fun. So fabulous. Mm. I love that. It's, it's like life just oozing, you know, and, and, uh, and originality. I just loved it. Oh, I, <laughs> We're looking it, for sketchy things. Sketchy things. <laughs> All right. Yeah. It's so, it's so fascinating how when we are children, we're just these sponges, right? We're just absorbing everything through all our senses. And, you know, we don't necessarily have, not yeah. all of us necessarily always have the mental fortitude to really, you know, quantify what it is we're doing or seeing, but right. just receptors. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Pure enthusiasm. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like you, with your work and a lot of your books. So the first one for me that uh, I was introduced to was frequency and this was yeah. years ago. Oh, and uh -huh. it was where I feel like you do that with, with your work, you're showing individuals, I think how to really unlock some of those things to be open to these things again. Mm -hmm. That's Yeah. I feel like part of my function is as a kind of translator you know, of really high concept, abstract conceptual thinking, large ideas that a lot of people have defined in a particular way through religion or, you know, certain ways of thinking about like I, what the heart is, for instance, oh, I have a broken heart. It's my romance. It, well, it's not romance there, you know, it's, it's like neutral understanding. So th there are things that I, I just know our refinements of thinking and I want to shift the point of view, maybe even just one degree mm. to get people to click in a little bit differently. Um, yeah. I don't want to be like some kind of rabble rouser. I want to like have people be able to get a fresh point of view on things that have been around forever, but have gotten jaded, mm. you know, and, and re rework a lot of this, but also to explain complex things in a way that makes a lot of common sense. So um, maybe that's why I grew up in the Midwest a lot, you know, <laughs> like I'm just down to earth. Mm -hmm. um, but, but yeah, so, so that is always my goal. And, um, and I've kind of waited like the first book and then some years went by and then, I'd get another download and then a little bit of time. It is like the explanation was doling itself out to me, do you know, like a little bit. And then as, and the world's frequency was going up because I could not have written frequency previously. In fact, I was thinking of writing a follow-up to the intuitive way on empathy back then. Hmm. And my publisher who had just published the secret went out on tour with Rhonda Byrne and came back and said, Penny, I don't, I don't think people are ready for empathy yet. <laughs> you know, they're, they're all about, you know, making money and, mm. you know, with the, the secret and all that and misinterpreting things. So could you go back to the drawing board and rework this? So I, that's what, where frequency came from. It just wow. came out like that. Um, but then leap of perception came, which is, you know, like, okay, how's the brain changing? And, how is linear perception changing to spherical? And, and this is the real transformation thing. I guess I realized early on that transformation was the most exciting thing to me. It's like magic, you mm. know, like um, 
I used to love psychic phenomena, you know, like in the, the Russian experiments and all of that, where they could separate an egg inside a vat of salt water, you know, with their mind, and stuff like that. But this is even more so. It's not just changing things. It's like changing reality. It's, you know, and so that I don't get tired of thinking about that, you know. And so now uh, there's another another one coming in. A transparency came in. It's like, what would it be like, you know, when you do get yourself clear? Right. What happens to you, you know, and, and your reality and your point of view and other people around you? And um, because I think that will be coming for a lot of people. And uh, and now there's another one, but I, I'm not talking about it yet. But <laughs> but every couple of years, it you know, but it's kind of like I feel I could almost sense like planes waiting to land, you know, mm. like just. Um, it's something I actually, I had a funny story when I um, finished literally writing the last word of um, leap of perception, I typed it and I burst into tears. I mean, I just like, Plah! you know, and I just started sobbing and a voice in my head said, you're done. And I went, Oh, am I going to die now? And like what, what's going on? And no, you asked to write these first three books on transformation and this is it. You did it. And, and then, then it said, uh, you can now write anything, anything you want, you know, but you wanted to do the, it wasn't like a contract. It was like you asked and, and you got to do that. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it, that was amazing. And then uh, two weeks later, the house I was renting got sold. I had to leave California after 30 some years. Uh, and it was like, boom, you know, everything was finally finished with that cycle. And it was amazing. But the energy that had been in me of this effort of doing all these projects and, and learning everything for it, you know, I guess that was, it just had to come out, but that was wild, uh, you know, so I love that analogy of just like planes landing and just bringing in just the, okay, <laughs> drop ship this. See you later. Like, right, that's, right. That's awesome. I love that. Yeah, just being that yeah. in tune. It, and I think the point you bring up about transparency, I think that's so crucial. I think now more than ever um, where I feel like even with frequency, it, it came at the right time, but still ahead of the time where I feel like, you know, our culture in, in this country anyway, mm -hmm. in society wasn't, yeah. they were on the precipice of that. And that, right need yeah. of it. So with transparency, I feel like it's important for folks to really have some sort of guide for when you do backslide. Like, Yeah. Yeah. I'm always a few years ahead. I think uh, frequency is still selling like it was like almost, you know, it's funny. It's just, it, it catches on in waves, I guess. And the intuitive way also, which is a right. course on intuition development. Um, but a lot of people haven't quite gotten to the the last two books yet mm. they don't but some are yeah some are definitely getting there um but there it's like a long reference book you know it's a long series that's yeah anyway so and sometimes when i'm writing too i didn't know that that information was there like i on uh, leap of perception i had no idea what that it was going to describe what was going to happen in the brain when holographic perception takes over, you know, and, or what is that anyway, you know, and it started explaining it to me. And, um, and then this whole, whole thing came in. So. <laughs> I think that's great too, because, you know, we, we can talk about it and we can see how, again, it, it's catching on and people are realizing that even just that, what the perception piece is and what it can do to us, how transformative it is. Yeah. Yeah. That was a, a tricky book because it could have been titled so many different things, but I did, I think the subtitle was the transforming power of your attention. Attention. Because I really feel that attention is the biggest thing that is coming. You know, it's how we create reality. It's how we travel through space you know, in, in other realms, it's all through um, placing attention on things and being with it 
you know, not willpower anymore, mm. not left brain power. Mm. It's by being with things in an affectionate way. And then everything starts to work like magically, you know? So, um, and we are, you know, so distracted, <laughs> tension deficit disorder, so fragmented, nobody pays attention very long to anything to go into it, you know, and we really have to learn those skills. I 100% agree. I think with <laughs> social media and everything else, just as added distractions and things constantly <clears throat> taking our attention. Mm-hmm. What are some things that, you know, you, f- you feel like people <clears throat> could implement um, to maybe help themselves protect their attention? Hmm. Protect their attention. That's an interesting phrase. Um, <clears throat> well, first, um, understand why it's so powerful, why it's, you know, what it, that it reveals a live connection with the world. It is a thing that allows you to see how big the self is and how much you actually know and, um, and how generous other things are to you and how much they give. If you, if you be with them, they'll be with you. Because when you make a real clear, attentive connection, it's mutual both ways. If you notice something, it notices you. And so then you, you're connected and you belong. And there's a, a feeling state that comes along with that, you know. But people haven't played with it long enough to, to sense the subtle things that happen inside your body that are positive. And so we just, oh, what's the next social media thing that's going on my Facebook page? You know, I better put something on there. And, and <laughs> you know, it's like, it's so much um, junk and, and so much, uh, you know, superficial stuff that we just have to wade through. One of my friends, uh, Sandy Sedgbeer, who does a podcast, has the started the No BS Spiritual Book Club. <laughs> Because she said, you know, to try to have people weed out their best spiritual books that they've really got benefit from and have a list of those, you know, so that because there's such a lot of of stuff out there that's kind of, you know, not very deep anyway. um, But protect your attention. um, Like I said, practice what it is, why it's great. Get interested in it. Then play with it. Keep your attention on something. And then one second longer, and then one second longer, and one second longer. And keep being with things a little longer and see what you start learning or how the other thing um, reacts and responds to attention. Mm-hmm. You know, often, you know, when I look at a, a flower or something, I often almost see it starting to like reveal all its layers. And I go in closer and closer, and then I become those layers. And I know what it's like to flower, right? You know, and or and die at the end of the flowering and and, and rest, you know, and go through the full cycle. You learn a lot. <laughs> Absolutely. It's so true. I think also periods of silence are pretty important that we don't allow ourselves to. Um, I used to do a thing where I would just take the pictures off the wall in a room and just be quiet with blank walls um, and have a, I don't do this, but I I'm wanting to now is to have a day where I don't turn on the TV or I don't have external stimulation from screens Mm -hmm. or radio or, or something and just be with the quiet or go out and see all the, what are the sounds that I just heard on my walk? You know, just tune into hearing, for instance, one sense. Yeah. We have to train ourselves though. Yeah. And it's increasingly more challenging for folks with, you know, them trying to keep up or folks trying to keep up with, social media again, or just what's news, current events, things of that nature, even just jobs going to and from work or 
taking care of a family. So Mm -hmm. a lot of Mm -hmm. challenges out there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Well, COVID has been a big help with this. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Oddly. Sure has. has. Um, uh, But people are in great resistance to it. Mm -hmm. Even so, you know, they haven't quite gotten it enough that they've relaxed. They just want out. I want out of the restriction. They Mm. don't want to feel what's inside of it. Mm. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Why, why as humans, why do we have it as beings? It's so challenging for us to, like you said earlier, to just sit in that, that silence or to sit in what it is and and literally feel it. Mm. It didn't all, it wasn't always that way before we had so much media and external stimulation, you know, we were farming and out with the horse, you know, and, or with the animals that were quiet or in the woods with the trees or the dirt or something, you know, we were, we were much quieter and deeper in our own thoughts. Um, I just think it's the proliferation of so many sources of incoming um, mental stimulation and because the frequency on the planet is increasing, we're all becoming ultra sensitive mm. or empathic, right? And so people are picking up energy information before it even becomes mental, you know, of um, expansion, contraction, fears, safety, interesting, curious, uh, uh, repulsive, <laughs> you know, whatever. And the body is reacting from the reptile brain mm-hmm. directly. You know, and we're not sorting this stuff out. It's, um, you know, I, I've often found that when you're just working from that visceral level, the energy goes up the spine and it gets stopped in the limbic area, kind of. And you often get headaches from energy that's stuck right in the back of your neck like that because you haven't processed it. Or, I mean, by, by that I mean, be, made it, let it be conscious. Mm-hmm. Say, w- what is going on here? And, and then it can move on up through the brain and make sense at some point, right? But we stop it there because it's a fight or flight kind of thing, maybe. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so I think we have to understand and be able to discern specific states of being that come with the whole body and the emotion and the energy body and, and then the thoughts that come out of that and compare that to what I call your home frequency state, which is where the soul is in the body. You are here present behind your eyes, you know, and looking out and uh, you know, being alert, making sense of things. Yeah. And um it's just too much, too much left brain right now, you know, too much left brain. <laughs> I don't know what you think about that, but no, I, it's, it's beautiful. I, I absolutely can align with that hundred percent. It's, it's, you know, I know you said um, something you had said is a great power intelligence in being vulnerable, honest, authentic, undefended. Mm. and available Mm. that state of vulnerability and just openness that's Mm -hmm. that's what i get from that well it's also innocence you know really um Mm. vulnerable is not a negative state (laughs) you know um i'm not i've never looked it up actually to see the root of the word but um but to me, it's it's just a, like an openness to surprise. It's like um, an openness to allow yourself to feel anything, you know, whether it's a uh, loud, hard, soft, um, ugly, beautiful. It's all energy taking shapes, which is very neutral, you know. Um, so I, I think it's just a, an openness to a, a, a greater reality, maybe a curiosity even, where you don't hold 
that's the kind of thing that we're kind of fighting right now in a way. It's like we're holding identity to ourselves. I'm this way because this happened to me in my childhood. There's nothing I can do about it. You know, like this is it, the way I am. Uh, no, that's not the, <laughs> the only way you are. You know, let go a little, Let's loosen it up. Don't hold it. Get bored with it. Let it drift off. And then you'll find out how much else you are. But we're, we hold, and it's like a psychic contraction within the energy and the body, you know, that almost like you inhale kind of energetically and don't exhale again. And it's like if you gave up holding all these things, whew, you know, you, you'd be able to experience, you know, a hundred times more. Yeah. I love that. It's it's fascinating because how many of us, you know, we, we like you said, we mentally, emotionally hold on to things, but then even physically, you know, this the clutter that we have in our lives, and we just hold on to things and keep things for one reason or another. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's an interesting process when your parents die, or you know, the, I just had a stepfather die, and I had oh. to uh, clear out lots of stuff, um, which is. It's interesting because like my mother was an artist and I had to let go of and try to sell at auction <laughs> some of her sculptures and stuff. And they went for like $15. They should mm -hmm. be like hundreds and hundreds. And I thought, oh, my God, you know, like she'll roll over in her grave, you know, but they're going out in the world, you know, and I got that experience of just giving them, you know, mm -hmm. and whatever. It doesn't matter what the money, it's like somebody wanted that. Now, it'll go somewhere, you know. So there's, getting rid of stuff is a really amazing process. It, it's shocking. And then the spaciousness is so amazing, that feeling afterward, like freedom, you know. Yes. And how can we maybe encourage folks that maybe are feeling some apprehension to letting go, whether it's a physical item or maybe an emotional feeling about something? How can we encourage those? Again, I think it's a function of comparison. Um, I have people often do a thing to find their home frequency where I have them go into their worst possible scenario and really make it bad. And then notice what the body's feeling. Then I have them put that on, on the shelf and go do their best possible scenario and make it really great. And then put that on the shelf and go back to the worst one and re-enter that. And, and you go into these contracted, awful states, you know, then you put it back on the shelf, come back to neutral, you go and you do, you rock back and mm -hmm. forth between those states. And pretty soon you do not want to go back to the worst possible scenario ever because you hate the way it feels. So now you can tell the difference between when your left brain takes over and take, takes you into the drama of the negativity and it's bad to change and all of that. And then you can go into the potential of having things be fluid and joyful or easy or help people help you and stuff like that. Um, and, oh, you know, your chest opens up and it's like, wow. So now you can tell when you backslide or now you can tell when somebody around you is trying to drag you down into their level, you know, or these different things. And then you, you're in charge of the way you want to feel. You know, the world is not doing this to you and making you feel bad. <laughs> you agree with it for some reason because you're unconscious about it. And when you're conscious, you can stay in your positive one. You know, so I think that um, anything about choosing something that's better, often you have to remember that there are choices between love and fear or unity and separation. And as soon as you go into feeling separate from the world, everything closes down and the, the flow stops almost. As soon as you allot, let yourself be connected to everything and everything's part of a greater whole. Um, 
and you are that greater whole at a level, you know, um, then the flow just brings you anything you need immediately. It doesn't even take time. You don't have to earn it. <laughs> it just happens, you know? Yeah. And encouraging people to, to be open to that flow, you know, uh, again, there's that fear, there's that love. How do we, how do we make the folks around us feel okay with being vulnerable? Well, I think there is a choice to be made to, um, to trust. And I call that in, I think in transparency, I call it radical trust, but it's like, um, I trust myself. I am the soul. I do know what I'm doing. I'm here. I'm making this body. I'm making this reality, you know, and I'm clearing away all my old beliefs that um, act as a filter that dampen down my positive results. I'm, I'm working on that. I'm clearing it. You know, so I do trust myself and I do know what I'm doing. And I do trust that other people are souls, that if they get really get a chance to improve and they can understand it, they will do it. You know, and I trust the flow, which is all of us together, the whole collective consciousness evolving together. And I'm a part of it. I trust us Mm -hmm. to bring me whatever I need next that's perfect for me. It's my favorite thing and I'm going to get to do it. And then I get to give it to everybody because they need it next. They need what I'm going to make next. And then they, I want them to do good work because I need what they, they're going to make next. So it's like this perfect fit, yeah. you know? And so that's the trust of the flow. You have to understand that it actually works to evolve everyone and that we're helping each other evolve. So you trust yourself, you trust the other, you trust the flow, you trust the greater consciousness that it's all in harmony and working together. And at some point, it's a choice you have to make, even if you don't have the full experience of it. Mm. As soon as you make that choice, you'll start to get the full experience of it. (laughs) Right? And if you make the opposite choice, you'll never get the experience of it. (laughs) Right? Right. Oh, it's so true. <laughs> now, I know uh, if, if, if folks were to be on your website, they can see that you do these mentorship uh, programs, courses, things like that. Mm-hmm. Are, are these some of the things that you guide people on how to do? Yeah, there's a, a, but a bunch of the online courses now that I've created that people can take on, oh gosh, all different intuition dreams. I have a journaling course. Um, we just did a series last fall called spirit talk, which was a four session units. And each of the sessions had a topic Mm -hmm. and it was discussion and experiential and questions and answers and discussion. Um, And so those are all on there. And a lot of the clips are on my YouTube page also. Um, And um, so those are there. And then of course I do private coaching and counseling intuitive mentoring Mm. and and do have different, you know, 20 minute, 45 minute, 75 minute sessions, depending on what people need. So that's all on there. I love that. Plus there's a bunch of free stuff. I have, you know, I do an Oracle letter every year I have since 2010. It's interesting to read back through them because a lot (laughs) of what I said back then is happening, you know, years later. Um, and, and there's uh, kind of random generated things where you can get a poem for the day or a quote for the day. Just, you know, fun stuff on my yeah. Oracles page. I love that. <laughs> we, we talk about journaling. Now, in your experience, did your personal journaling lead to you wanting to be an author or vice versa? Like, was the author first chicken, egg? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, I started journaling when I was about seven and no kidding. Yeah. And wow. so I've always loved, I guess I've always loved writing mm-hmm. and, and that sort of thing. Uh, um, um, 
but so I had been writing in journals for so long. And then when it came time, I always used to say, you know, I did all these courses and trainings on intuition development for many years. And then I said, well, I'm, I've done that. You know, what's my next courageous act? And that's what I would always say to myself. So what's like beyond my comfort zone? And it was to write a, a book on this intuition training. So I, I think I can do it. So I, I did. I wrote it. But then I hired an editor, thank God. <laughs> she, she was so compassionate and great. And she it was like another seminar I could have taken, you know, for the amount of money I spent on it. But it really helped me learn how to structure things and pare things down so that I, you know, I didn't give too much. And um, yeah, so so that I did that. And then that got in my blood, you know, then I, I really liked the, I liked the, it's, it's like design, right? You know, to structure a book, you have, you know, components and, and um, it has to have a flow, it has to relate and the, you know, you can't be redundant. And so I, I, I had read a few books where the language carried the energy of the thing that the writer was saying. Uh, one of those was the Sri Nisargadatta. I don't know if you've ever read him, the I Am That book, which is an incredible no, no. book. Um, but they're alive. The sentences, they're alive. And I said, I want my paragraphs to be like jewels. I want them to carry the energy. I want them to be alive. And so I really, really, I had little post-it notes all over, like do, you know, have it be like this and do that. And um, so I think I really taught myself to write. I had done a lot of poetry early in my life before that. And uh, I think I kind of put a lot of the poetic principles maybe um, into my nonfiction writing. So, um, and to make it easy to understand that I really liked that challenge. So uh, I guess it was all, you know, of a piece, <laughs> you know, as I went along. That's, I uh, love that. You were able to just take <laughs> all of your influences and, you know, your creativity and then really put it in to, yeah. wow. And I love the fact that you were wanting those words to be those, those jewels for people to read it and just feel it mm -hmm. and resonate with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I always would start a book and say, okay, should I'd invite the writers in the sky, you know, say, come on down, come on in, you know, let's do this. Mm -hmm. So that I didn't feel like I was alone or I had to think it all up myself, but I knew that there were great writers who were in, in spirit. Why don't you come in and play, you know, mm -hmm. we'll see what we can create here. Uh, so I, I always do that. That is awesome. <laughs> it's just great. It's just, it's, it's fun to be able to think of it from that perspective, you know, and just inviting all those that are still with us or here have gone on to the other side now. Hey, come on in. Let's do this together. Right. Right. You know, cause I, I, uh, I had a, a dream once where, um, there was a, I was standing in a room with a bunch of um, firefighters who were all in t-shirts and kind of muscly and all that. And there was a guy in, in the center of the circle that needed healing. And I said to these guys, okay, let's, let's do it. Let's do it and, and get yourself together. And, and they just came right in and they had been just waiting for something to do because they're used to action and they want to help and they want to rescue people and they want to do things. And so we did this guy. And then I moved on from that room into another room where there were all these fancy older people dressed in evening gowns and tuxedos, and they were at a big gala dinner. And I'm wandering around and one of the men says, oh, don't worry. I know so and Senator so-and-so, if you need any help, I can get in touch with him and blah, blah, blah. And all these people were like, oh, if you need this or that, you know, we can help. And then I realized that all of them were dead. Everybody that I'd been talking to was, you know, 
just on the other other side and uh, waiting for something to do. And they just ask, you know, or just volunteer that you need whatever you need. (laughs) And that really changed me. Uh, After I woke up, I was like, oh, my gosh, there's so much help. But we never ask. You know, and I'm sure like the those privileged people, they they're good at telepathy. You know, they can like put a thought, help put thoughts in people's minds or help coordinate synchronicities or something, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, so that got me more into working with the non-physical realms in a real direct way. I love that. When we think about ancient cultures and civilizations, they had so much more emphasis on, you know, their ancestors. I think right. more than our modern culture does anyway, at least here in this country, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I would hope that when I'm on the, the in the, I call it non-physical life if, <laughs> instead of death, <laughs> uh, when I'm there, that somebody will call on me, you know, right. like be fun. <laughs> right on. Yeah. Bring a little channel through or whatever, you know, just (laughs) beaming in. I love that. So what are some, some different avenues that you think you're possibly going to go down? You know, do you, do you have some preconceived notions? I know there's a book you don't want to talk about that you're working on. I totally respect that, but like, what are some other ventures? Like, you know, you have, have you any new thoughts? Well, there are all those planes waiting to land, but (laughs) other than that, um, I really do want to be able to travel again and go to other places that I haven't been, uh, but I usually go for work. You know, I haven't really traveled just for pleasure. That might be an interesting experience. Sometimes. <laughs> uh, and, um, and I really like gardening. I grew up partly on a farm for a while. So I really like um, agriculture and, and the whole art of, of gardening and farming, but mainly growing food. Yeah. I like um, and um, art of all kinds, new kinds of art that I haven't done before or something, you know, different medium. Hmm. So um, I, I also, <clears throat> I had this thought that, that, you know, consciousness is very stretchy and that you can think of something you'd really like to know about and just expand your ball out to encompass that. So that it really is consciously inside your entire reality as part of your present moment. And that I can tell myself, I really do know about this. I do know how to do it. I understand it. And I can integrate it into my personal reality. And I'm going to start to know how to do it and be able to do that. So part of what I've always wanted to do was read the Akashic Records Mm. really well. Um, and, and but there's a lot of rules about it, you know, and and it's not as easy, I think, as a lot of people think. I think it's a very privileged kind of thing to be able to do, and you have to have a lot of ethics. Um, so I'm just experimenting with that. Like, mm. um, like I like mysteries. Like I watch the um, archaeology shows where they're digging up, trying to find gold or whatever it is. But I don't care about that. I care more that. Um, how did, did how did the original people bury it in the first place way down there you know like where where did that come from or um and i want to know the ancient history of the planet mm. so there's part of me that's kind of using part of my consciousness to go into some of those um places that are even undiscovered you know or like Gobekli Tepe in in Turkey, you know, like what what was going on there? Because they've hardly even uh, uncovered, you know, a fifth of it or anything. You know, it's an amazing place. And yeah, so so you know, privately exploring that kind of stuff. But wouldn't it be great if you were good enough to be able to go on a dig and say, look over here, 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 and this is why, and these things are interrelated and. And, you know, be able to know these more of these things. So I, but that's, that's just for fun. You know, (laughs) I'm the same way. I feel the same ancient cultures and civilizations. I want that ancient knowledge just to know the hows and the whys just, Mm -hmm. that's the stuff that absolutely fascinates Mm -hmm. me, which is. Yeah. Yeah. 
it's, it's kind of what put me on the trajectory to do this podcast. It was a suggestion uh, of, of my, my good friend, George, who produces the podcast. So uh-huh. just kind of like now I get to have these great conversations with wonderful individuals like yourself. And just, it's just as much of a learning process for me as it is to share this information and knowledge mm-hmm. with others. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, uh, well, if we can really understand the, the ancient history of the planet, you know, and the, I think there's a lot of connection with intergalactic beings and all that stuff, but I don't talk about that too much, <laughs> but I'm, I've had a lot of dreams with them. And, um, uh, but if that's true, then I think it might slow the culture down a bit to go back and feel like mm. revise all of our ideas about like how old the pyramids are or, um, you know, dogma in religion, mm. that it's really um, a distorted version of deeper truths that is trying to preserve something, but it got screwed up along the way a lot of times by everybody's left brain and uh, and priesthoods, which I don't care for that much. I don't think we need a middle middlemen or middle people to mm. bridge it to us particularly. You know, we it's a direct connection we can have. Yeah. Um, so yeah I love that maybe the time's not quite ready for it in you know popular knowing yet you know but it's getting there Mm -hmm. you know it's getting there yeah Yeah. I agree it sure is I I think we're seeing that more and more with just people being more open-minded and open-hearted to conversations about things that were once esoteric now are a little bit more exoteric. Yeah. And there's a reason why some things still have to be esoteric because emotionally still most of humanity is not ready to handle that kind of technology or, um, you know, that sort of, they can't even handle racism. (laughs) <laughs> right. You know, like let alone intergalactic <laughs> beings. Um so anyway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I agree. <laughs> agreed. Getting that raising that vibration, you know, getting our frequency. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's it's it'll happen. I yeah, I think the acceleration is is happening a lot faster. It's almost like a geometric progression Mm. rather than an arithmetic progression you know it's really accelerating fast that's going to create some major major uh, dramatic changes on the planet absolutely which i think is great (laughs) 100 (laughs) percent. where can folks find you on the internet yeah, just my name, pennypierce.com, but it's spelled oddly. It's P-E-N-N-E-Y and then P-E-I-R-C-E. You say oddly. I think uniquely. Uniquely. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uniquely. <laughs> yes. Um, I like being different, but then sometimes it's a, like a little pain in the neck, you know, like having to. I had a, one of my publishers misspelled my name on the cover of a mock-up for my book. <laughs> I said, don't you people have proofreaders? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Anyway. Oh. Yeah. And uh, can folks find you on, on Instagram or Oh, Facebook? yeah. Well, I'm not a big, I put, I don't put fancy stuff on Instagram, but I have pictures on there. And, um, but uh, YouTube, SoundCloud, awesome. uh, medium.com. I have a lot of articles on there and, um, and my own website. And what else do I have? Facebook. Yeah. Awesome. And you do have a yeah. YouTube channel of your own as well, right? Yes, yes, yes. And where can folks mm-hmm. find that? Yes, it should be under my name. I okay. I don't even know exactly what the address oh. of it is. But yeah, it's, 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 no I b- keep adding some, we're doing a lot of um, excerpts, little snippets from some of the talks now that are, you know, really fun and to watch and, you know, have nuggets of good That's stuff awesome. in them. I love that. And uh, <laughs> folks can buy your books right from your website, straight from you? Um, mainly from Amazon. And, okay, perfect. And I think, yeah, easiest. Penny, thank you so much for, for joining me on this. This has been an absolute pleasure and an honor. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> 
And there you have it. I absolutely adored my conversation with Penny. I can't thank her enough for sharing her time, her space, and her energy with us today. I just truly admire her in so many ways. We talked about so many things, and honestly, I would implore everyone to check out her books. I mean, we only scratched the surface talking about some of the books that she's written. We talked about frequency, the power of personal vibration, a book that got me into Penny's work, as well as the intuitive way, transparency, and leap of perception. I just love how she's able to illustrate that we don't always often notice what's right in front of us, but that it's our spirit and thoughts, emotions, and body that are all made of energy and that inside us and everywhere around us, life is vibrating. Be sure to find Penny on the internet. You can find her at pennypierce.com. P-E-N-N-E-Y P-E-I-R-C-E That's pennypierce.com. There you can learn about a bunch that Penny is offering from free nuggets of inspirational quotes and readings to even some of her programs that she has like mentorship, courses, and different events. You can also check out her newest Oracle letter for 2022. And be sure to take a moment and check out medium.com where Penny has some other writings available on that site. If you're listening to this podcast, take a moment and rate the podcast if you could. And if you're watching this podcast, be sure to hit that like button take a moment and subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell so that you can hear about new episodes that are coming out next. You can find us on Instagram at itd.jcosta as well as on Twitter at itd underscore jcosta. I can't thank you all enough for joining us on this journey. It's so rewarding and I'm learning so much with each episode, with each amazing guest that I get to communicate with. Be sure to share these episodes with some folks that you think might be interested in this kind of material. Until next time, take care of one another and keep thinking for yourself.